Today on Young Leaders in Tech, we have Luke Wren Cullen, who is the founder of Tune Release and Applaud.Live. Tune Release is a media pitching platform that secures coverage for the latest song releases, and Applaud.Live is a bookings platform for the live music industry. Luke is also the marketing, communications, and community lead at Scale Ireland, an independent not for profit organization which supports, represents, and advocates on behalf of Ireland's tech startup and scale up companies. Aside from all of this, Luke is also a freelance violinist and a former president of the Trinity Orchestra in Dublin. Luke, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Uh, love you to be here. Um, so before I begin, um, apart from all of the above, can you just give me like a brief, brief background on yourself and how you got where you are now? Yeah. So I'm based out in Blanchester in Dublin. Um, I started violin when I was about four, which kind of was my first step into the, the music ecosystem. And then um, after a number of years, I was in and out of orchestras, the likes of Dublin Youth Orchestra and the National Youth and then the IT, and got to the stage where at college, that was my kind of go-to extracurricular and joined the orchestra. Um, throughout that experience, I was kind of doing corporate wedding and festival events. Um, the festivals more so with the Trinity Orchestra and we're doing the likes of Electric Picnic and yeah. All Together Now and the good fun stuff. Yeah. Um, but when I started to take kind of a managerial role there for, for the year, um, uh, as president, what, what happened was it was very difficult to kind of decide how much should we charge, what are the logistics involved, and yeah. and th there's a lot behind the scenes that, that goes on because we were starting to do the likes of Dropbox Summer Party and the National Concert right. Hall and big events with uh, a lot of outgoings as well. So we needed to know what our incomings were. Um, so that's where Applaud sort of came from. Um, the initial idea was a, an app, uh, hence the name, but uh, I was quickly dissuaded from that by oh. a couple of mentors in the likes of the Blackstone Launchpad Sprints. And rightly so, um, building an app means you're going to build a lot of products blind and you're going to get no validation on it until it's launched yeah. and you're probably 20 grand down. Yeah. So we launched a Squarespace website and learned the fundamentals of entrepreneurship with the, 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 the Blackstone Sprints and um, kind of graduated then onto the Launchbox program. So that's kind of where I... Um, dived into entrepreneurship and, and learned a lot about founder stories and how people have gone about it in their, their respective industries and seen what worked and what didn't. Yeah. And um, so you just spoke briefly there on your, when you started Applaud, was that the, just seeing the managerial side of things? Was that the reason for starting it, seeing that there was a gap in the market there? That was your reason? Or... Big gap in the market. So you had the likes of Airbnb coming to the fore and launching in Ireland around then and I was kind of there going, why, why isn't there a marketplace for musicians? Because it's hard to find out where customers are. It's it's impossible to know what your competitors are charging. Yeah. And uh, there's just no parity or standardization in it. And you should remember, most gigs were cash in hand. So yeah. you'd be at the end of the wedding going, oh, who has the burnt envelope? Right, right. And, a lot of pain points there. It is the right amount of cash in it as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so after co going coming across a lot of problems like that, I, I was there saying, right, this could be distilled into kind of a very simple process of a directory of musicians, online booking and a, and a strike checkout. Um, so th there was, um, you know, the issues of, are you technical? Can you build your own product? Yeah. Um, who do you need around you? So very quickly I was there going, oh, who's the computer science students? Uh, where do I find them? And let's get them on board. Yeah. So I, I got three co-founders then, Brian, Connor and Gordon, uh, but we're all from different years in college. Right. So that's not an ideal situation for founders because ideally you wanted to work at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, we did the Launchbox program over the summer, built uh, quite the Frankenstein of a platform with a hybrid of languages and whatnot. Um, but I learned the kind of the, the experience of how much direction devs need and that they need to, you know, take the time out and really ideate on what's the best tools to use, languages. Yeah processes so it was a good learning curve and i'd never say i regretted any of and, it and you did all of that while you were studying at the same yeah. time was it right yeah, a, lot, no, a lot of work there juggling a lot so we did the dissertation the the company and the orchestra and then there's a couple other roles as well tied up in that and you finished up then in, in 2019 was it yeah and um then i was also doing the new frontiers program at the tail end of final year college um yeah. so i don't know if that's kind of allowed but sure look i'd never say no to free <laughs> mentorship yeah. Um, so did that with TU Dolan. It was a brilliant program. Um, my weakness is, look, I have, I have an arts degree background, uh, did English and history. So um, where's the financial background there? None. Yeah. Um, so it was great for getting kind of the templates on doing projections, business plans, whatnot. I think that the main um, deterrent for founders is if you're generating revenue, you're dealing with clients, doing all that stuff is actually probably going to negatively impact 
on yeah. what you're doing because it's taking you away from the day-to-day. -day. Um, what it's good at is kind of refocusing you on the bigger picture and what's the next steps I need to do to, to get ahead. Yeah. Know? And did you, that, you, so you went straight from university to working that full-time? Um... Pretty much. Um, now, I did supplement it a bit with, I was teaching violin at the time. Um, the New Frontiers program was, it's really well structured. It gives a stipend every month for six months. Yeah. Um, so that allows uh, you as an entrepreneur kind of to, to take the time out and really get to grips with what you're trying to build. Um, I was in a lucky position. I'm living at home. I'm young. I don't have uh, much to, to, to worry Points. about in that yeah. regard. Yeah. Um, so I just reinvested the money back into the company. And um, I suppose a big learning curve for me then was if you hire developers, developers are very expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, you end up spending the money very quickly and you end up, wondering oh do i need to take out a loan and we did do that and we were mobile optimizing the site and spent a good bit on that and we were just about ready to launch and then COVID hit right um, okay <clears throat> so yeah that that's kind of what happened to applaud and it's kind of in limbo until COVID passes and yeah because there's happening. no gigs obviously yeah at the moment yeah. there's no um, point flogging a dead horse you know <laughs> yeah um so like apart from your your business there you're also involved with scale ireland um which as i explained earlier helps startups around ireland so what kind of help does it provide do you provide with that yeah so scale ireland is very much a, a startup in its own right and um, it's a spin out from dogpatch labs in 2019 and the the main focus at the beginning was uh policy um i think brian caulfield has a great analogy that uh, and he's the chair of scale ireland so when you ask the farmers um who do you talk to in terms of creating policies and who's representing them? It's, it's the farmers association, you know? Yeah. Whereas when you talk to the startups, we're a very fragmented bunch and no one knows who, uh, who to talk to and who has the, the, the relevant data. Yeah. So um, tech Ireland or scale Ireland very much arose from that. And we work a lot with actually tech Ireland in terms of the data collection. And um, so tech Ireland do Trojan work in that regard uh, and scale Ireland kind of just uh, refines it down into submissions and summaries and reports. Um, now we're working on, so we have a new website that I've been working on that we're going to launch very shortly. Um, and we have a Slack channel. So the Slack channel has about 500 founders on it. Um, and the main thing there is to foster kind of peer to peer learning. But the great thing is as well, there's a help channel and right. the help channel is just an amazing resource for us to say where our founders struggling. Um, and the, basically the just a big, big feedback loop between all the huge. people. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And it, it kind of makes life a little bit easier for us because we don't have to go out hunting for the information it's coming to us now which is brilliant um and then we could kind of articulate it into different submissions especially with the likes of ewis had the the department of finance review very recently and we submitted that on february 12th and that was kind of an amalgamation of the alliance for an innovation driven recovery which includes the likes of hban with the angel investors the ibca which is the more you know uh, established vcs and tech ireland with the, the data push and mm. uh, Euronext, which is the IPO stage of the journey. So it was very kind of representative of each step of the entrepreneurship journey. Right. And um, the of the startups that you've dealt with so far, the ones that you've seen, what, what's the kind of most common issues they see? Um... Yeah, um, go to market is a big one. Um, product development is another huge one. So what I think is quite pervasive in the industry at the mo moment is there's a lot of service providers that... Um, the likes of tech, HR and whatnot. And they're very expensive for startups mm. to avail of at the very early days. Um, ideally, you want to be doing it internally and learning your processes in, in and out so that when you do approach a consultant or a, a, an out or a freelancer, you're able to say, look, this is what works for us. And I know how much time she'll be involved in it. Um, so the big issue has been around building product. Um, if they're outsourced and they're going to be 20 to 40 grand minimum, um, sometimes a lot more if it's deep tech or yeah. anything in a new vertical that's just emerging. Um, and then legals as well. They're, they're, it's very hard to kind of know what, what should be on my term sheet if I'm going the, the funding route. Um, what founder should I surround myself with? Um, who should be on my board? And what's kind of the done deal? Because like fundraising, it, it's heralded as this amazing thing. And it's a great metric for for seeing how well a startup is doing because it's, someone buying in and saying, I agree with this vision and mission, but the best validation is, is revenue and yeah. customers um, paying for a product. So I think what we'd like to see a lot more is founders getting a really good grounding educationally um, and also being able to go to market earlier um, than they would if they're, they're stuck building product for six months to 12 months. Yeah. Um, 
Now that, that depends on how deep tech they're going. But yeah. yeah, so I've seen a lot of people have um, asked the question whenever a new startup comes along or someone's just scaling up their business, is it product development or is it customer growth that you should focus on at the beginning? Um, a lot of people say with startups, get something out there quick and then get feedback. Um, is that yeah. the case for you, you think? I agree. Um, so it's a brilliant question as well, a uh, chicken and egg kind of thing. Yeah. Um, for us, we made the mistake with applaud focusing on products and we focus on product for many, many months. And on the side, you're kind of trying to generate revenue just to show some validation. But unless you have something that works, um, you're kind of, you're not going to be able to nail the revenue side or the sales side. Um, the second part of it is kind of with tune release. It was my second time doing something. Um, and the second time you do anything is going to be so much better, quicker, faster, effective. Um, so we launched it in 24 hours. It was just a, a landing page on a website. And it's a manual process. So I, I think there's a great meme out there with the, regards to enterprise SaaS. And at the very early stage, what, what happens is you've the team of founder grabbing um, the info from the customer and then doing it manually and bringing it out the other side to, to provide the, the service um, on pretending that it's all automated. Yeah. Um, but that's the best way to do it because you're earning out every piece of logic, workflow that you need, uh, which information is required, where can you put off a bit, a bit of the... the the fat and the edges, you know. The, cu the customer requirements as well, what they find to be the most important might but not be yours. Yeah, yeah, and you're talking to them. That's the main thing, you yeah. know. If you don't talk to them, you won't learn. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, there's two companies you started, obviously, are based around the music industry. What, what kind of other industries have you worked on with Scale Ireland? Yeah, so we're seeing quite a plethora of different uh, verticals being tackled. So th there's med tech, huge amount in there. FinTech as well. Um we're seeing a lot of augmented reality startups as well, which is quite cool. Um, kind of future of e-commerce essentially. So you've AOR, which ties in with that in terms of yeah. visualizing products in your home, but you also have the likes of Claire McHugh and Axonista doing uh, video commerce, which is an emerging kind of trend over in Ireland. Um, and then you, you've kind of product itself and logistics, which would tie in with the likes of Bobby Healy and Mana, Mana Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a lot of really exciting stuff and stuff that can be exported so well. Uh, it's really incredibly scalable. Um, and I, I think the tricky thing there is just to make sure founders can can do that as quick as they can. Yeah. And have, have you noticed any differences between the music industry and everything else or similarities that people might not be aware of? Um, but the funny thing with the music industry is like the phone never stops. So you might get a call or an email at two in the morning because most of us are night owls. But um, in terms of industries, I, I love my two-sided marketplaces. So the music industry is full of that kind of component of you need um, two entirely separate entities, be it the, the media outlet or the musician or the sync agent and whatnot. Uh, in terms of other verticals, though, there is that, you know, uh, J curve that MIT call it, um, where innovation driven enterprises invest heavily in the R&D uh, aspect. And because we're a young team, while we did invest heavily for what we have, it's, it's tiny compared to yeah. some well-established companies. Um, and then revenue comes a lot later and your cost of goods goes down dramatically, which I think is the main thing. Like we, we've seen a, I think a 70% drop in our cost of goods from shifting from a service provider to a, an essentially a marketplace SaaS product. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And um, so moving on to like, a, how can startups get the help that you're talking about here? How You've gone through, like you said, the Frontiers program. Um, you've gone through quite a, quite a bit for startup support. How can yeah. other people avail of this help? How do they find out about it? I, I suppose use the biggest search engine out there. Um, you have the likes of Google, uh, YouTube, obviously, and then Reddit's a good un, un, underutilized place as well. Uh, and really? then there's a lot of Facebook groups popping up and Slack groups as well. Reddit as well for... Yeah, you just find the odd community that, that actually has in-depth knowledge about certain areas and really helps you along. But I think in terms of, as a founder, if I was going back to square one and I'd be saying, where, where, where should I go? If you're lucky and you're in college, go to your local or local enterprise office as well, where you're based. But if you're in college, go to your um, entrepreneurial society. And in Trinity, we had tests and you could do like the Dragon's Den and stuff and build a bit of credibility and get a bit of funding. Yeah. Um, then there's the likes of um, program accelerators run in the colleges themselves, the likes of Tangent or UCC Ignite. Um, go on a step on from that after you get your local enterprise office kind of support. You can get mentorship from them. You can then go for the feasibility grant and get half of what you spend on development paid back. Now, I think that needs to come with a big, big warning sign. Um, because if you're very young and you don't have capital uh, and you see, oh, I can get 50% of my development spend covered, I must go out and find that capital. It decentivizes you from finding a cheaper alternative. Um, 
and it, it makes you spend more than you would have if you didn't have that incentive. So for us, the grants would have been perfect probably a year later. Right. We, we had tackled them too soon. So we, we took out the loan and, and put it into the R&D. Um, and now we have to pay it back. But in fairness, paying back a loan is a brilliant incentive to just go to market, do sales, and yeah. do what you want to be doing. Get your money back, yeah. Honestly, yeah. And, and in that regard, tune release was kind of a blessing in disguise. Um, in terms of other supports, there is the Competitive Start Fund with Enterprise Ireland. A lot of startups do leapfrog that, though, and, and just go straight on for the HPSU program. Um, and then more recently, you have the lovely NDRC program, which was launched. And it's kind of really great to see uncapped um, safe notes being used because it's very founder friendly in terms of um, it'll only convert when you're actually able to set a valuation on the company at a later stage. If you're doing your, your seed round or a series A, depending on yeah. what size the round is. And so like a lot of people just think that help means funding, right? But there's, there's other stuff as well, surely. Free mentorship programs. New Frontiers is free. Um, all these college programs are free. Um, Startup Boost with Gene Murphy is free. Um, all this great mentorship and those people passionate about it and who've been there and done it and know how hard it is, are there willing to give their time and expertise. But I think the main thing for a founder is, look, d d don't send a ream of information that you want someone to solve all your problems. It has yeah. to be, you're an expert in this specific thing. I would love um, just to do a bit of a brainstorming with you about tackling this specific problem. So if you're looking for funding, grab a VC. And there's loads in the likes of Frontline, Elkstone and whatnot. And, and they'll sit down with you and they'll grill you. And that's what you need. Yeah. And um, so I think- they, they will poke holes in it, like, but that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Like a lot of them have accountancy backgrounds and whatnot. And you see that a lot in Ireland, especially. Um, but I think the, the best advisors are going to be previous founders that have exited or are currently still scaling their businesses and are yeah. in the trenches. Yeah. So moving on to another one of your, one of your topics um, is the, you're a big advocate for the no code solutions in startup. Can you, can you explain to listeners what that means? Yeah. So the no code movement is, it's relatively new. So it has been around for, I'd say bones of a decade. Um, but I think it's only emerging in Ireland at the moment. So essentially what you can do is you can build in days or weeks rather than months or years. Um, instead of spending two and a half grand on a developer for a little project, you're going to spend 25 quid a month uh, on a platform. Now, I think at an early stage founder will look at the likes of these tools and be like, oh, it's an extra bill to pay every month. And how do I escape that? That doesn't matter if you've built a product and you're generating revenue. It's going to be minuscule in the grand scheme of things. But spending 20 grand on a developer, I, I, it's strangely easier to justify when it shouldn't. Yeah. Um, because you as a founder are going to bring yourself on leaps and bounds in terms of, oh, now this is how the workflow works for a developer. This is how much time they need to think about it and come up with the right thing. Um, and maybe even this is how much time I should allocate for this specific feature to be built. Um, so now while I'm still non-technical, I, I know a lot about you know database architecture uh, workflow in terms of the logic needed and what information is required from different users. Um, so yeah, the, our stack is a probably a pretty common one in terms of startups that are going lean and, and, and going to market as soon as they can. Start with a lovely marketing website on Webflow. Um, then you can progress to supplementing that with um, a web application builder like Bubble or Adalo. And um, then you can kind of really start generating revenue with those integrations with Stripe, plugins, whatnot. It's like a really juiced up version of WordPress, I yeah. suppose. And um, that can obviously ex accelerate, uh, go to market. Yeah, yeah, we've seen companies like uh, Plato over in YC, I think generated over 800,000 in revenue on no code platforms and then raised 13 million. Um, there's another one called Dividend Finance, I think that did over a billion in loans. Um, crazy amount of money to be done over a non-custom platform. But I think for us anyway, and the mission or the vision for us is to um, utilize what we built with Applaud um, and kind of reconfigure it a little bit to incorporate the tune release features because it's a beautiful custom fast application that we have control over. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, well, there's no point letting it go to waste. Yeah. And then once I suppose, once you have the funding, if you do feel like you need more customizations, you can, you have the revenue yeah. to build it yourself at that stage. Yeah. And we can make an end to end process. So the big vision for us is kind of, can we take an artist from their bedroom right over to the main stage of a festival? And there's so many nuances in that journey and, and this, they need a huge team around them traditionally yeah. to do that. But I think there's this movement towards digital labels and automation that empowers an ordinary Joe soap to, um, to do what often requires years of experience or training. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so what, what, what are some of the other benefits apart from like speed to market and, and saving costs? What's some of the other benefits of no code solutions that 
it just like instead of having to hire a big team of developers you are spending less than 100 quid a month and to manage your entire suite so your cost of goods is ridiculously small and your r&d spend relatively is quite small um and just in terms of validating new features so you can a a b test everything you know what i mean you could you could do um like for us just to give a kind of reference you could do one by one submissions via credit system but next week i could build a, a bulk submission thing for x amount you know and very quickly i could test that on 50 to 100 users and say nice. right which one do they prefer and kind of what's the higher average contract value as well yeah you can iterate more quickly you know yeah that's nice very agile yeah, yeah. and um so moving on to the how, how how does how does someone implement no code solution yeah um so we went about it kind of with very easy to use tools like squarespace iteratively getting better at them and then finding oh the complexity of this isn't what we need and it's too basic so move over to webflow and then we're like oh but now we need a form to merge with a database and while airtable does the job in terms of database management and you can automate some of it and um, you need a web application at this stage and then you decide oh do i need to spend 20 30 grand uh, on a web app oh no there's bubble okay grand right. 25 quid a month uh learn the ins and outs of that and you just become such a better manager at it um so you you can just i suppose network like there's no code communities as well setting up so there's no code founders which is run by a lad called jt and then even in the slack, the scale ireland slack channel if you put put up a question like what stack of tools should i be using um myself or anyone else using no code tools will happily just point you in the right direction yeah you know? and they'd, they'd be fairly well documented now if you wanted to use one thing or another yeah that's the thing like the likes of bubble i think raised their first round last year of a couple of million Previously, there were bootstraps. So there is that element of tech debt, and, and the platform's not, you know, um, the, the the industry standard of Adobe yeah. or anything like that. But it'll get there, you know. And um, c- c- can you can you actually build complex like enterprise level applications? Yeah. yeah. Like for us, um, we've done personalizations, dynamic content in terms of files, imaging, everything like that. Um, we've built quite a comprehensive data set and, and directory as well. Um, there's e-commerce functionality on it. There's, um, yeah, everything's personalized to them. There's, there's unique logins and yeah, we can even track metrics and do an- analytics. I think the biggest stumbling block for me was how on earth do I get this to work and show the analytics and the KPIs I need. Yeah. Um, and what I found is I can actually build a, a KPI dashboard for the team, check in and it looks terrible, but it yes. has all the figures we need. It does what you need. You yeah. Know? Um, um so yeah, it can be very complex. It's just about finding the nuances. So I'd highly recommend doing like a YouTube series of videos from course. a local person or a Udemy course. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds, it sounds definitely like something. Um, so for anyone else listening, I'll be um, getting all the links to all of the different information that um, Luke is providing me here and they'll be in the show notes um, below. Um, but moving on, so like a more topical, I think. So you mentioned briefly earlier that COVID kind of put stop to some of your plans. Um, has it changed how your your um, outlook has for the next few years? Yeah, yeah. So I think COVID kind of put forward the need for more digitization in the industry, but also uh, the need for automation. So uh, and the need also as a bootstrap startup to increase your your profit margin. Um, mm-hmm. Like when you're talking about, I think a lot of startups make this mistake of, oh, if I have ten thousand customers and I'm charging them a cent each, I'm getting some revenue in the door. But it, it's kind of rubbish. You, you, why you undersell yourself if you're doing something incredibly good and you're you're saving them so much time so we went back to the drawing board we i i just remember having tons of coffees pre-covid with artists and saying what's the question they've asked me at the end of every meeting and it's always been oh you're getting great pr with applaud how do i do that for my music and you just reverse engineer the process and you say oh well that's actually what they're looking for you know um so go back to kind of your North Star metrics. What's the, the key granular issue that your users want solved? Don't bite off more than you can chew. Yeah. And go to market. Literally just go to market. Yeah, get out quick. Uh, and have you any other uh, plans uh, for anything else at the moment? Or anything? Yeah, so after Applaud, we pivoted into tune release. And, and from that, we were luckily enough targeting the same market segment. So now that we found that there's a huge demand out there for tune release, like artists are just really keen on getting their music out there, rightfully so. Yeah. And what they're not so keen on is the high entry cost of of promoting their music. I mean, if you're to hire someone to manually pitch hundreds of outlets, yeah. it's going to cost a couple of grand, you know, for a proper PR campaign. 
And you think you think with with the amount of time that a lot of people might have had over the last year, there's probably going to be a lot of music coming out at the end of this. There's so much. And the the fact that tools have come on leaps and bounds in terms of mastering and mixing them yourselves, or they have the time now to go out and do the Udemy course, learning how to mix and master the tracks as well has been great. There's the rise of marketplaces where you can you can collaborate with artists from Sweden or France or you name it, and you can get producers from around the world that have worked with likes Ed Sheeran or or Amy Winehouse to to mix and master your track. It's incredible. So th- there's all these new opportunities arising. I think one one area that I think is really cool would be the likes of Zoom gigs. I- I've seen ticketing wise, it's yeah. starting to work. Um, unlisted YouTube videos is not the the solution. It's it needs a, a more nuanced solution. And then, I mean, artists earn a lot of their their money from merchandising at those gigs, but there's no video commerce at the moment. Right. Yeah. So it, it, there's an area there to explore as well. Yeah, yeah, I was just just about to ask about that because I have I have been on a couple of Zoom gigs now and they 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 worked very, fairly well. Like yeah. towards the beginning of the pandemic, yeah, there was people using microphones from headsets or something like that. But now, kind of people have got their got their stuff together um, for recording online. So I presume you're you're planning on building something for that or yeah, uh, yeah them definitely. Um, because each essentially, if you want to look at the artist's journey as a, a, a staircase or a ladder. Um, at the very beginning, you start with the production process. And if you're your product, essentially, and I know um, people don't often like classify music as a product, but that's what, what they're trying to get out to the masses and they're trying to get royalties on and commercialize a little bit. Um, if that's not good, um, your success rate with your distribution is going to be poor. Yeah. Um, PR is just not going to pick up on it and media and whatnot. You're not going to build that uh, retention with your audience that are going to listen to your next song, your next song or buy your merch or buy your tickets. And then as artists kind of graduate in that process, um, you're able to unlock the value for the artist. Um, and that can be through merchandising, ticket sales, um, doing the gigs and think deals and whatnot. Because I think a new area that I, I'm looking to explore now that we kind of have the data, because we get songs earlier than Spotify. We get yeah. artists coming to us saying, I want to know how to distribute my song and get it to media. So free Spotify, we're able to say, oh, talent scouts, you know, um, big labels are looking for talent. Uh, yeah. How do they discover talent? We don't know. Uh, usually it's A&R, warm introductions. There's a big area where you can track the metrics of an artist's growth and pass it on. Um, secondly, there's um, uh, sync placements, which need a lot of kind of uh, nuances in terms of is the content of the song relevant to the ad placement? Um, there could be natural language processing done there. There could be a bit of machine learning integrated yeah. in terms of auto-labeling the songs as well. Um, so there's there's some really exciting uh, verticals we can explore, and I like to keep it as open a book as possible. Yeah, sounds sounds great. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. Um, so it, it, as I do with every podcast so far, I just like to leave the, the talk on a on a key takeaway. So what's your your key takeaway for someone who who's starting out in a position like you are? Just go for it, because I think the biggest regret I would have had would have been stagnating or, or not doing what I wanted to do. Um, I think looking back. Five months ago, I'm an entirely different person. Um, just the amount of learnings uh, being on the startup journey this uh, just makes you learn is, is incredible. Uh, it, it just beats it into you whether you want to learn or not. Yeah. Um, but then do take some time out and take a bit of time just to, to, to really think about the big picture. Um, have an hour reading a day or listen to an audio book or go for a walk because you need to clear the air. And if you get stuck in the weeds, um, you're, you're likely going to forget the big picture and find yourself doing absolutely everything instead of um, getting expanding your team so you can um, delegate a little bit more. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you found that this has helped you in any way and might help someone else, it'd be great if you could like, subscribe and share it on any of the social medias you're involved on. We do have a website at youngleaders.tech where you can find links to all of our social media accounts. There you can also listen back to other podcasts, meet up recordings and have a look at our reading list where we have a list of books, podcasts and blogs that have been recommended by our speakers. I'm always looking for new speakers as well, so there's a contact form on the website where you can send speaker recommendations if you know of anyone that would be suitable. Again, thanks for listening and I hope you come back to the next episode.